gorilla about six, eight million years ago, and the chimpanzee and the bonobo about six million years ago. The bonobo is sometimes called a pygmy chimpanzee. So Jared Diamond once called us the third chimpanzee. And actually that wasn't just a you know, facetious remark. If you look at this, realize we are closer to chimpanzees than they are to gorillas. And we are closer to chimpanzees than mice and rats are to each other genetically at the level of the genome. So it's remarkable. Just look at this picture and say, what happened here? So it's really a question, not just for evolution, but for us as humans. How did we get here? So we are not just a random product of one corner of evolution. You can look at it that way, but there's also something very unusual about us and something to be explained. So I guess one question might be, how different are humans and chimpanzees? At the level of genes, I won't go into it. At the level of proteins, don't make it too dark, everybody will fall asleep. <laughs> Leave some light on in the back. Primary rule of lecturing. And it turns out ah, that's good enough. Okay, uh, so the level of proteins, your proteins are 99% identical to those of chimpanzees, again, closer than that of mice and rats. The level of genome, it's about 97 to 98%, depending on which part of the genome you look at. So that's very interesting, and that's kind of what I work on. But at a different level, you can say, if you look at books by Jane Goodall or Tetsuro Matsuzawa or any of the others, Matsuzawa is one of the other speakers who's going around the country right now. Chimpanzees are remarkably similar to humans. Every time you look around, you hear and find that they're doing things very similar to us. At the same time, if you look at books by uh, John Cohen and Jeremy Taylor, these are uh, journalists who decided to look into the question. They say, wait a minute. Humans are remarkably different from chimpanzees. Can you imagine chimpanzees having a public lecture series of this kind, and you listening to me. So actually, both statements are correct. So it depends on what you're interested in. I'm interested in both questions. And I, I think rather than argue about it, we should say, well, we want to know what's similar and what's different, and that's how we find out. So I tend to work on the molecular level, and here's the standard model of life. DNA makes RNA makes protein. But there's an unfortunate uh, tendency to then go on to say that makes a cell in an organism. In other words, the DNA makes the organism. DNA is the blueprint. That's very incorrect. DNA is a recipe book. It's not a blueprint. It's just a recipe book full of a bunch of recipes. And depending on how you use the recipes, you end up with something different. I once made a thought experiment. Imagine two identical genetic twins, Japanese twins. One becomes a sumo wrestler and the other becomes a Buddhist monk. And the alien anthropologist comes and says, these are two different species. It's the same genes, right? So, and the other reason this is not correct is that there's not only DNA and RNA and proteins, there are lipid membranes, there are glycan sugar chains that cover every single cell in nature. There's a massive forest of sugars that most people have not even studied. It's barely even in your biology textbooks now. And though you put those together, glycoproteins, glycolipids, cells, tissues, organisms, organ, etc., and you, you have an organism, but that's not all. What you eat is going to affect you. Of course, you signal back to DNA. What you eat is going to affect you. The microbes and parasites, you may have heard the statement that there's 30 times the amount of DNA in you that other than your own DNA. That's microbes and parasites. You're just a carrier for a bunch of microbial DNA, if you want to look at it that way, and they influence you. Physical environment, and in the case of humans, cultural environment and social environment. So this is a more complete view of biology. So my lab for many years is focused on these glycans. These are the sugar chains that cover the surface of all cells. And this is a cartoon. We know much less about these than we know about proteins, but here's a bunch of sugar chains on cell surfaces. And the tips of these sugar chains is something called sialic acid. This is what influenza virus binds to. This is what cholera toxin binds to and so on. So we've done a lot of 20, 30 years of molecular biology and, and biochemistry on these molecules trying to understand their functions. And they're important for brain development, the kidney, infectious disease, immunology, so on. But things actually changed for me first in 1984 when my daughter was born. So nothing in any preparation in medicine, pediatrics, biology prepared me for watching this helpless mass of nothing become a human being. So how can that be? It's truly amazing, isn't it? That year I also saw a patient with serum sickness. A patient with aplastic anemia or bone marrow failure, in which we still today give, for reasons we don't fully understand, a kind of Hoss serum, and the patient developed a serum sickness reaction. Not surprising, right? You put Hoss serum into a human, you're going to get a reaction. 
Then to my surprise, I found that the literature said that the immune reaction is against sialic acids in the horse serum. So how can that be? Sialic acids are present in all, all organisms, uh, vertebrates. To cut a very long story short, what I found out is the following. A difference in the sialic acids in humans and the so-called great apes. This is the same phylogeny looked at in a different way. Basically, we found that while one kind of sialic acid was present in all the species, the product of that sialic acid, the addition of a single oxygen atom, was missing in humans. And we traced this to a mutation that occurred about two million years ago in the human lineage, giving rise to um, a mutation. So we are sort of like a, a knockout mouse. You know, people make mice where they knock out a single gene. And we, about two, about two or three million years ago, one human ancestor lost this one gene, and that became fixed in all of humans. So once this happened, uh, this happened at that time, we had found the first known genetic difference between humans and apes. And I got really interested in that. And to cut a very long story short, I'm not going to go into this. We've been studying the genes of humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, rhesus, baboon, mammoset. And when it comes to uh, genes related to sialic acid biology, don't worry about the details. Each of these is a gene. Humans have undergone a lot of changes. You know, it's hard to find difference between humans and apes. And in our system, we've found more than a dozen. So we think we've found a hot spot in human evolution. It affects the brain, the placenta, so on and so forth. But that's really not the subject of my talk today. If I was giving this talk about five years ago, I, this is what I'd be talking about, and telling you about how this affects biology, disease, so on and so forth. So I've been applying, with my medical background, applying the sialic acid biology to uniquely human diseases and to what I call anthropogeny, not anthropology, anthropogeny. This is actually a term which goes back to those questions we, too asked, we asked. Where did we humans come from? How did we get here? It's really a very old term. It's in 1839. For some reason, it got lost in, in the literature and started getting used only about... Uh, uh, it disappeared about 60 years ago, so I brought the term back. Anthropogeny is the investigation of the origin of humans. Where did we come from and how did we get here? And so if you want to study anthropogeny, you need to study anthropology, of course, <coughs> but you need to study lots of other things. You need to study social sciences, biological sciences, arts, humanities, biomedical sciences. They need help from engineers and computing people, and you need to understand the climate and so on, and understand chemistry and physics. So anthropogeny actually sits in the middle of all these disciplines. So if you really want to understand the origin of humans, and that's why we formed the center called CARTA, where we bring people, linguists, biochemists, anthropologists, neuroscientists, philosophers, etc., together to talk about this issue. So I was very, very interested in this, and I started exploring, I continued my research in sialic acid biology, human chimpanzee differences, but I spent a lot of time trying to understand what makes us human. Occasionally when I give a talk, say five, six years ago, I was still very shy about talking about anything but sialic acid. Occasionally, I'd start talking about what makes us human. If you ask that kind of question, you're guaranteed somebody's going to come up. Somebody's going to come up to me after the seminar, I'm sure, say, no, 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 you got it wrong. Every human has their own theory, be it philosophical, theological, existential, biochemical, neuroscientific. Everybody's got their own theory about what makes us human. So 2005, University of Arizona gave such a lecture and I sat down for lunch and this fellow sat next to me and said, you're all asking the wrong question. So I said, yeah, here we go again, you know, somebody with an idea of his own. And it turned out he was a well-known professor. He was an insect geneticist. He studied Drosophila. And he gave me this great idea. I never heard this idea before. So I said, Danny, you should write this up. He said, he said yeah, I'm just an insect geneticist. I said, no, no, this is very important. It's, I think it's original. So I never heard from him. And two years went by, I kept thinking about it. Everything I read said that he was on to something new that had never been suggested before. So I started sending him emails. Still no response. So I decided to call him up. Uh, so, oh, before that, I'll tell you, uh, as I read about what he was thinking about, uh, while before I was trying to get in touch with him, I asked a question which he was really talking about. Which species are self-aware? In other words, there's a lot of species that are, are aware of their surroundings, but we know who, I know who I am, you know who you are. Each of us knows who we are. We have a personhood, an individuality. Turns out that's not uniquely human. It's been studied in different ways. I hope this movie runs. Let's see if it runs with the sound. This three-year-old chimpanzee has never seen a mirror before.
He's not sure what to make of it. Erect fur is usually a sign of fear or anger. But his fear is soon replaced by curiosity. This chimp appears to know that that's her tongue and those are her teeth. So once the chimp really knows, it starts examining itself. A concept of the bodily self that allows them to look into a mirror and say, that image is equivalent to this body. But how can we prove that humans and chimpanzees really identify the figure in the mirror as themselves? Psychologists have a well-known test for this. It's called the Mark Test. A researcher marks a child's cheek. The child then looks in a mirror. He moves his hand up to the mark. He recognizes himself. By the age of two, half of all children tested can recognize themselves. Soon, they all do. So, can our ape cousins pass this test? A keeper places a mark on a female orangutan. Next, they put her in front of a mirror. She has seen her reflection before, but this time, she notices that something has changed. Her hand goes to the mark. All the great apes, gorillas, orangutans, chimps and bonobos, can pass the mark test by a certain age. pretty clear, although people argue about the significance of this test, that most of the great apes, actually gorillas often don't pass very easily. They know who they are. They have a sense of self. You try this on a monkey, it doesn't work. You try this on a dog, it doesn't work. You try this on a cat, it doesn't work. They look at the mirror, they think it's another, and then they start ignoring the mirror because it just bothers them. But then it turns out that if you do this on a dolphin, the way this is done is with a two-way mirror. So the dolphin sees a mirror and you see the dolphin, right? So the dolphin is seeing its own reflection. And this dolphin is very curious, is trying to figure out what this thing is in the mirror and starts examining itself. But then what they did was they did the mark test on the dolphin. And here's a dolphin that has just had a spot put on its head. And this is actually a dolphin's had it done more than once. It thinks it's really cool to have a spot put on its head. So what it does is, uh, as soon as the marker, it rushes over to the mirror. And obviously it can't reach up and touch itself, but it does everything possible to get on that thing. Sometimes it starts to rub it off and so on and so forth. So it's pretty clear that many dolphins can recognize themselves in a the mirror. Killer whales have passed this test. One out of three Asian elephants, the first time they, they made a very big mirror for the elephants, <laughs> have passed the test. Um, so you can still say, well, Danny Povinelli is a skeptic. He says it's just body self-image. It's not really self. So what Derek Denton did was he took a chimpanzee who had already seen this mirror. The chimpanzee was already quite used to the mirror, could play with the mirror, examine itself. And he put a circus mirror in front of the chimpanzee. So here's the chimpanzee looking at a distorting mirror. First it says, what the heck is that? And gradually, and I've seen more of this longer lengths of this video, it, it actually starts doing an experiment. It wiggles its backside, it puts its hand out, it does various things, and finally figures, oh, that's just me, it's just a bad mirror. You know? <laughs> so basically, 
looking at things like this, you can say very likely chimpanzees have a pretty strong sense of self and there are other tests like this. Of course, we can never know, we can never be in the mind of a chimpanzee, but it seems very likely that they do. So if you go back to our evolution of vertebrates, it turns out magpies have passed this test, some birds. And those of you who have seen crows around know they're pretty damn smart, right? Elephants, apes, dolphins, but many of the others in between, rats, rabbits, uh, others that have been tested, carnivores, don't pass the test. So it means that self-awareness independently emerged, independently, in each of these lineages, you know the principle of evolution, right? Either things were common ancestor or they independently emerged. So these things have been independently emerging in all these species. So it's happened many times. So what Danny was saying is self-awareness, I mean, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty close to us. He's saying, uh, so he said, you know, how come, if there have been all these self-aware species around, there isn't a human-like elephant by now? How come there isn't a human-like bird or a human-like dolphin? They're really close to us. And their minds are very much like ours. So he came up with a very interesting idea. He said, something's holding them back. And we escaped. So I said, I really have to have him write this up. Although, I you know, what I'm showing you here is a lot more than what he had originally, because he didn't have a lot of time to research it. But this is what I found out when I researched the literature. So I tried to look him up on the web, and I found his obituary. He woke up one morning with a severe chest pain, and was in coma by evening. He had a strange kind of heart condition, and he died. He was four months older than me. And so, I, what do I do now? So, I looked around and found one of his friends had dedicated something. So, yeah, Danny had some interesting ideas. Too bad he never wrote it up. So, I decided I should at least put this idea out there. I'm not an expert on this, I thought. So, I wrote a letter to the journal Nature, which is called Human Uniqueness and the Denial of Death. And it said, Brower's contrarian view could help modify and reinvigorate ongoing debates about the origin of human uniqueness and intersubjectivity. It could also steer discussions of other uniquely human universals, such as the ability to hold false belief, existential angst, theories of the afterlife, religiosity, severity of grieving, importance of death rituals, risk-taking behavior, panic attacks, suicide and martyrdom. So I thought I had done my duty. Two months later I get an email from his widow who says, that is so wonderful. Danny was trying to write a book when he dropped dead. Can you please finish his book? So I have completed a book with, uh, with a, written with a dead man who I met for an hour and a half. The book just came out and it's called Denial. So, uh, before I go back to what Danny's theory was, let's ask a question. What mechanisms underlie human differences from the great apes? Obviously, we can look at genes and culture and there's no question that it's genes and culture working together. This idea of nature versus nurture is, forget it. Without nature, you don't have nurture without the other. You don't have a genome, you don't have a hu human. If you don't have a family and a society, you don't have a human. They just work together. So that I think we can set aside. But now let's go back to Wallace. Why did I want Wallace at my, my dinner, my pick of eight people? I chose Charles Darwin, you say, that's pretty obvious, right? Some of you may know that Wallace actually co-discovered natural selection independently, completely independently. He wrote a letter to Charles Darwin saying, respected sir, what do you think of my theory? And Darwin said, oh my God, somebody's had the same idea. But he did the right thing, they co-published together. Wallace lived for years longer than Darwin, but he got himself into trouble for various reasons. One is he had a few strange ideas about, for those days, it, he may have been one of the early communists, there were various problems with his social approach to things and so on. But the one reason he really got into trouble, he said, I can explain everything by natural selection, conventional, simple natural selection, except the human mind. There's something very funny about the human mind. Uh, compared with our closest relatives. Back then they already had an idea of chimps are our relatives, now we know they are. So I call this Wallace's conundrum. He said, how could natural selection at all favor the development of mental powers so entirely removed from the material necessities of savage men? So uh, he, here's what he said. He said, if I take newborn babies from uh, Borneo and bring them to the United Kingdom and give them every opportunity, they can be British gentlemen. In fact, the study has been done in America. We have babies that came from everywhere in the world who were born, of course, in America, but are born from people who left Africa 100,000 years ago. And you go to the University of California, Berkeley, you'll find all of them there. So, so he said, how could 100,000 years ago, the beginning origin of humans, the ability to do calculus and astrophysics and theology and everything else was already there? How can that be? How does evolution pre-produce something? 
Is that a fire alarm? I hope not. No. <laughs> so he said an instrument has been developed in advance of the needs of his predecessor. So Darwin wrote to him and said, you're tearing down the edifice we built together. Natural selection must be the cause. He said, then what he said is, I'm not saying it's not natural selection, but discovery of new facts and new laws of a nature very different known to us. It's not conventional natural selection. Some other form of selection occurred and some, something happened. And of course, given the time of the day and the time, he, there was a lot of discussion whether he was invoking primarily God. And he wasn't. He was invoking evolution as well. He was just saying, look, we don't know. Let's keep this aside. Let's not claim that we know the answer to this. And so, but because of that, scientists sort of dismissed him saying, well, he's forgotten about natural selection, he's lost his original ideas, and so they stopped listening to him. But I think he still had to some, had something on. His, his point remains valid. How did the natural selection select ahead of time for capabilities the human mind have only exploited recently? So you probably heard the term exaptation. The word pre-adaptation is not, it sounds as if there was a plan. That's not correct. Exaptation means dinosaurs had feathers and now birds can fly, right? So something was used for something else. But that doesn't mean if I bring a dinosaur here, it's going to fly. This is like bringing a dinosaur here and having it fly. So how can that be? So I think that experts in human evolution and cognition have yet to provide a satisfactory explanation for this remarkable transition and appearance of this mind. So here's my candidate mechanism, biological mechanism. We are characterized by unusually prolonged helplessness. We have extended nurturing and goes on for many years and it occurs in the context of mental maturation during extended neoteny, that is, uh, you know, uh, premature states of the nervous system. So in fact, it's recently been discovered that your brain is still being completed around the age of 26. So parents will now try to not be able to understand what they've been dealing with with their kids and those and teachers will understand what their problems have been in college. <laughs> so in fact, our brains are, are take about 30 years to develop. And that happens under the, under the influence of the previous generation. So we have this feedback loop. My daughter is born in America. If I put you on the phone to her, she's an American. But she has the genes that came from South India. So we have this incredible ability. So this, I think, partly explains Wallace's conundrum. So I think we use extended development, plasticity, to invent, disseminate, improve, and culturally transmit complex behaviors over generations without the need to hardwire it. You know, if you're a mouse or a rat, you're born with most of your abilities hardwired. You learn a few things. If you're a chimp, you learn some things, but not so much. You do learn quite a bit, elephants, dolphins. Interesting, in many of the other species we mentioned, they learn postnatally. We just learn a heck of a lot more and we stay plastic for much longer. So there's innovation and imitation. This is the other thing uh, that Tetsura Matsuzawa, the famous primatologist, told us at this meeting. Every other species can emulate, can try to do the same thing that another individual is doing. Humans are very good at imitating. We see something once, twice, and we do it. So in our population, we have innovators and we've got imitators. So as soon as somebody comes up with something, everybody else can pick it up. As you probably know, there was no zero in Greek or Roman mathematics, and they had a serious problem until Aryabhata and India came up with a zero. Nobody had ever thought of the concept of nothing. For 100,000 years, nobody had thought of the concept of nothing. So then they came up with a zero in the decimal place. Now a five-year-old will tell you what a zero is, right? And yet, it took that long. But we have something else that goes on. Our population increases. So the number of innovators increases. So it's not really fair to compare 6,000 chimpanzees with 6 billion humans. We have a lot of innovators. And we have more and more of the, of the inno innovators. And we also communicate. And we communicate in a far more sophisticated way with language and so on. But it turns out the other thing we do, and that's absolutely quintessential to what happens here, we teach. No other species teaches. A chimpanzee mother will allow her baby to try cracking nuts or doing something. But the chimpanzee mother never reaches over and says, no, 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 not like that. Do it like this just doesn't happen. And Matsuzawa conserved this, uh, confirmed this in the meeting we just had. The only species that teaches. So why should that be? If you have a chimpanzee or a dolphin or an elephant that can do very sophisticated things, why can't it just show the other individual what's wrong? So now think of what I'm doing right now here. I'm not only self-aware, I'm aware that you are self-aware. I know that you're, you, you're an intentional agent. I know that if I throw a stone at you, you might throw it back at me. But many animals have that. 
but I also know that uh, you know you might leave leave the room and tell somebody else about me or something like. I can start to understand the rudimentary theory of mind. Turns out chimpanzees have this, and there are many other terms for this: intersubjectivity, attribution of mental states, mind reading, perspective taking. But the phrase, unfortunately, sort of jargon term is theory of mind. I not only have a theory of my mind, I have a theory of your mind. But if I'm a chimpanzee or an elephant or a dolphin, my theory of your mind is rudimentary. I kind of know you're another individual, but I'm not really in your, in your head. So in humans, we go further. We have third-order intentionality and full theory of mind. I'm not only aware that I'm self-aware, I know that you're self-aware, you're aware that I'm self-aware. That's why I can give this lecture. You can go and tell somebody else about what you heard and, and with the internet in 24 hours there may be somebody across the planet who's saying, oh, that's what Barkey said in St. Xavier's College in Bombay, right? That's theory of mind. And we go further, we have extended theory of mind. You think of the internet as one big brain, right? No other animal can do this. So really, what in, in effect, what you're saying is that I'm not only aware of myself, I'm aware of your self-awareness. And we're all aware of each other's self-awareness. So in effect, what Danny was really saying, uh, he didn't really realize what he was saying. I had the luxury of reading more about it and thinking about it. He's saying, what's the big, what's the big deal? If I'm, a, if I'm a chimpanzee and I'm aware of myself, why can't I be aware of another chimpanzee? What's, what's, what's the problem? So think of it, what this, take theory of mind and remove it from humans. And if you see the movie called Rain Man, some of you probably see it, right? Dustin Hoffman is an incredibly smart guy but he just can't relate to others. Imagine a world full of people like Rain Man. Nothing will happen. Each one of them may be very smart, capable, but there won't be any lectures, there won't be any teaching, there won't be any convey and communication and so on. So I just randomly took some topics, say acting. You guys are just in the middle of, I know, of you getting ready for your plays. What are you doing? You're creating a new mind in yourself, right? And you're transmitting that mind to somebody else. Somebody's imagining a mind that doesn't even exist, right? Uh, Romeo and Juliet never existed. But the person sitting there watching, you can imagine Romeo and Juliet, blushing, comedy, lecturing, organized sports. If you're playing a soccer game, it's good to not only read the minds of your, your compatriots, your, your team members, you want to read the minds of the others if you can. And everybody better read the mind of the referee, right? And of course, the audience is reading the minds of what's going on, and, and you're getting a feedback from the audience, and, and they're cheering. <laughs> Reputation, inheritance rules, justice, laws, teaching we mentioned, torture. Humans are the most fantastic species of torturing because we can read the mind of the other person. We know what we're trying to achieve. So this theory of mind is, without this, if you do the thought experiment, take it away, I can fill pages full of things that you wouldn't be able to do. Okay, so really we went from self-awareness to the awareness of the self-awareness of others, right? So, why is it uniquely human? I mean, if all these species can have this ability to be aware of themselves, why can't they be aware of another thing? So I'm going to present this theory, and Daniel Dennett said that any theory that makes progress is bound to be initially counterintuitive. And this theory is going to encounter some resistance, not only because it's counterintuitive, it goes against the standard thinking, but also because it's a theory by an insect genetist who's dead, and a physician scientist who claims he understands the human mind. We are not the people to write this book thing, but history is full of such examples, and I hope it turns out we're right eventually. So here's the human. Presumably went through various stages and uh, became with fully extended theory of mind. Here's a chimp, an elephant, a dolphin, a jay, and a crow. They're stuck there. So I've coined a term, psychological evolutionary barrier. They're stuck. They cannot go beyond this. So the basic idea is that it's not that they didn't have the ability to evolve, but every time somebody evolved full theory of mind, they stopped in their tracks. So instead of saying natural selection gradually improved our brain and made it better and better and better and finally we got where we are, yes, but many species with 100 million years have been coming up here and they're stopping short. They're bouncing against it. So think about it more like a physiological barrier, going from water to land. You can evolve all you like in water, right? Try to go to land, it's tough. It's a barrier. You've got to have ten things happen just right or you're never going to go on land. It only happens a few times, right? So here's a somewhat complicated slide which explains the idea. All these species I mentioned, most of them have long life species with complex social organization, and there's plenty of literature about social selection, how it increases intelligence. Naturally, you have to have a lot more intelligence if you have to deal with others. You might become self-aware. You might develop a rudimentary theory of mind. You get this helpless young. 
the a human baby is not going to survive without mother, grandmother, aunt, uh, you know, so on and so forth, and now schools and so on and so forth. Cooperative breeding, we do this thing. So that can improve theory of mind, right? So one of the theories about why we got so far is we started becoming cooperative breeders, but the cooperative breeding was essential for the survival of the individual, of the baby. And so that's another theory. So there's a lot of theories like this, and you put them all together and you say, yeah, this should give you full theory of mind. Should be, should be, it should just happen. Should have happened many times. Let's say that you observe the death of another individual. So here's a quote from uh, White Fang by Jack London. He's talking about a wolf, a very intelligent wolf. He had no conscious knowledge of death, but like every animal of the wild, he possessed the instinct of death. To him, it stood as the greatest of hurts. It was the very essence of the unknown. It was the sum of the terrors of the unknown, the one culminating and unthinkable catastrophe that could happen to him about which he knew nothing, but about which he feared everything. So every animal has a built-in fear of death. They don't know what it is for sure. Now, I'm sure you've all heard that elephants and and crows, how they react when one dies. Chimpanzees do react. Dolphins react. So all these animals and birds, they're kind of getting death, almost understanding it. They're sort of understanding death. But what they're not understanding is their own death. They're understanding death as a thing. They're not understanding what that means. I'm going to die. But you look in the literature, so this is the idea, basically. An animal of rudimentary theory of mind sees another death, is a bit upset by it, but doesn't bother him or her too much. Let's say you're an elephant in Africa that has theory of mind. It's wonderful. You can read the minds of others. You can take over. You can dominate. Isn't that fantastic? And one of them dies. You say, oh, my God, that means I'm going to die. What are you going to do? You're going to hide out. You say, I'm not fighting that bull elephant. I'm not taking that risk you know, going looking for salt across the desert. I'm just going to chill out. I need to stay alive. And you might even get into hopeless existentialism. You might even commit suicide. But the most important point for the point of evolution, you'll fail to reproduce. Your chance of succeeding is very low. You have a handicap. You've got this terrible anxiety. The built-in fear of death has now become real. Every day you wake up and say, oh, I'm going to die. What am I going to do? I'm going to die. So the idea is that you fail to propagate the full theory of mind. So humans are different. This is Ernst Becker, about 1970. We know that the human animal is characterized by two fears that other animals are protected from, the fear of life and the fear of death. The human race is the only only one that knows that it must die. It knows this only through experience, Voltaire. I was raised a Christian. One of my Hindu postdocs came to me and said, this is all great. The evolution stuff is new, but the Mahabharata had this already. Those of you who know the story know that uh, Yudhisthira's brothers are, are, are uh, come to, he comes to rescue his brothers from the Yaksha, and the Yaksha says, asks him many questions, that he must answer the great questions of life. What is the greatest surprise? Yudhisthira replied, people die every day, making us aware that men are mortal. Yet we live, work, play, plan, etc., as if, as if assuming we are immortal. What is more surprising than that? Why is it that we don't get up every day and say, oh, I might die today? Why is it that anybody can drive a car on the streets of Bombay? you know, and not stop short at every corner, right? The answer is denial. So um, denial, unfortunately, is a term with many meanings. There's no correct term to describe what I'm talking about, but I've happened to chosen this term. The publisher liked the term. So it's an, I'm talking about an unconscious dis-defense mechanism characterized by refusal to acknowledge painful realities, thoughts, or feelings. An unconscious mechanism or semi-conscious mechanism where you simply ignore things. You're out on the streets of Bombay, it's very dangerous. You know that the, every day you see about how people die, but it's not going to happen to me, right? I'm, I'm invincible. Nothing's going to happen to me, you know. It happens to someone else, not, not, in, not me. So here's, here's the idea, crossing the full psychological evolution barrier. Full theory of mind, deny reality in general, deny mortality. So now you're home free. You can have the theory of mind and not worry about mortality, right? So what, by the time I got Danny's book, I realized that he was coming to the same conclusion. I, by the way, I met this man for an hour and a half, and I know his mind. And it's like, to all of you know his mind now. He's alive here today, right? That's theory of mind. He was thinking the same way I was thinking. I said, denial of mortality, I said to him originally, that's too complicated. How can you have a specific module? But then there should be neurological problems where people get a defect in this. Actually, he eventually started talking, and I came to the same conclusion. Denial of reality. We just deny any reality we don't like. You know, 
you know, you need to exercise and keep your healthy, live longer, you know. Yeah, maybe I'll do that next week, you know. So, uh, you know, I know cardiologists who smoke cigarettes, right? Health trainers who are obese, right? And so on. You can look around you, you'll see this all over the place. So now you have the psychological tolerance, you successfully reproduce, you have benefits of theory of mind. And there's huge benefits of theory of mind. You can take over the planet like we have. You can teach, you can communicate, you can tell people things, you can pass on words. Language, of course, would take off in the middle of this. If you had language already, I don't know, but if you did, it would just explode. Now, here's the thing. Once you learn to deny things, you can also deny things for yourself. Self-deception really dominates now. The ability to, to fool yourself. And as you know, the best lie of all, George w, George w. Bush was convinced there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. He really was convinced. He had convinced himself. Not all the people around him, but he was convinced. Self-deception is the best way, it, and politicians do this all the time. They eventually come to believe their own lie, right? And that's the best way. So then, uh, my friend Pascal Gagneau, who's a primatologist and evolution biologist, said, hey, you know what, that's a really good mating strategy. So if you can tell lies and eventually believe your own lie that you are the super person, then the other sex will probably think, think you are, you know, and so on. So, uh, but initially this would have been very unstable. There would have been this period of time when people are telling too many lies, some people are denying reality, some people are still scared of death, and this would have to evolve, and this would have to happen to a few people. Now what I'm describing is a very, very, very rare event. A very rare things, sort of like crossing in from water to land. So here's a cartoon from Calvin and Hobbes, those of you who know. The cloud of stars is our galaxy, the Milky Way, our solar system is on the edge of it. We hurl through an incomprehensible darkness in cosmic terms. We are subatomic particles in a grain of sand on an infinite beach. I wonder what's on TV now. So, each of you is really a hologram made up of subatomic particles that appeared at the Big Bang and somehow managed to come together for some tiny period of time and you're going to be gone. And of course, religion can explain some things to you and maybe just for some, not for others, and can have other theories and philosophies and so on. But at the end of the day, you are nothing as an individual, right? So why is it you don't get up every day? Why is it everybody who doesn't, some people who have a, either a religious or a philosophical approach can handle that. But atheists don't get up every day and say, oh, I'm nothing, I'm going to die today, you know. So we have a built-in system to do this. So I call this the theory of mind stabilized by denial of reality or the mind over reality transition. So if you happen to get the book, by the way, disclosure, if you get the book, I get a few bucks. But, and, and the price is coming down. The publisher will kill me for saying this, but there will be a cheaper copy, I think, in India, I hope. So um, the, uh, if you want to really, the book has a lot of stuff in it. That's, I'm not going to talk about a lot of it, but it has the introduction. If you want to really get the core of the idea, you can go all the way to the last chapter called Coda, which lays out the theory. And there was a chapter called Future Directions, uh, which uh, uh, originally I called Difficulties of the Theory, but the publisher made me change it to Future Directions. They didn't want me to say the, how many difficult, there are difficulties like with any theory. So here's, a, let's go back to what I told you about human evolution. When did it occur during human evolution? So after our common ancestor with the Chimpanzee is very clear that there were many, many kinds of species of various kinds, and they've been reconstructed here using various types of skeletons. So about six million years ago, we stood upright, our ancestors, Chadensis, Tugensis, Ardipithecus, Australopithecines, and then there were some dead-end species that disappeared, like Paranthropus, and then our genus Homo appeared about two million years ago, then there were the Neanderthals, they looked very much like us, Bigger, bigger brains than ours, very smart, survived for 300,000 years in the, in the ice ages. And here's somebody who's made a cartoon, not a cartoon, a, a hologram to indicate that if you, Neanderthals are so close to us that if you saw them in the, in the subway and didn't look carefully, you might mistake them for a human. They were very close to us, but they're gone. Then comes us in the last two million, two, 200,000 years. So about 200,000 years ago, there are bones of people that look just like us called anatomically modern humans. And current evidence suggests that all the humans on Earth may have arisen, the genetics suggests, from a few thousand ancestors. A few thousand ancestors gave rise to everybody, not only in this room, but on the planet. And, but we gradually replaced all the other species over the last few tens of thousands of years. We spread, I'll show you a little map. We spread across the planet out of Africa, 
We encountered Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other, uh, other Africans, all kinds of people. We bred with them. We could breed with them, it turns out, the genetics. Each of you has 2% Neanderthal in you, because we met them at some point. But, you, but none of you has 30% Neanderthal. So those people never managed to incorporate into our, into our society. This is very different from any other groups of species. You know, there are bears that are cross-fertile, there are wolves that are cross-fertile, but they live in their own groups. Occasionally, one, one group expands and the other one contracts, and sometimes they're extinctions. This is as if the grizzly bears of the world, of North America, came out, took over the planet, and replaced all the other bears on the planet with slight breeding. As far as I know, and uh, I'm, I'm in challenging ecologists, I don't know of any other species that's done that. There are cases where species go into narrow extinctions, and, but I've never heard of one spe subspecies, cross-fertile species, that just simply replaces all other species. So it's just remarkable. So modern humans came out of Africa, spread across about 70,000 years ago, went all the way to Australia, and gradually replaced all these other species. And we have bits and pieces of their DNA in us, but very little, depending on where we came from. So if you go to the time scale of 50,000 years ago, there were all these other species. Many of them disappeared. Nobody knows for sure, but the anatomically modern homo sapiens that had all the bones that looked like us, but they didn't have any of the archaeology that looks like us. Became behaviorally modern humans. So we are, these are two interesting books, we are the lone survivors and the masters of the planet. And maybe, maybe we are the lone survivors because we are the masters of the planet. So how did this happen? There's a gradualistic theory, we just gradually got better and better and replaced everybody else. The other is the saltational theory, something sudden happened, a new event occurred. And the two theories are not mutually exclusive, they could be both true, but I favor a saltational theory because of how quickly in time this occurred, about 100,000 years ago. What are the factors? Climate, geology, language, anatomy. We have evidence that an infectious disease constricted the population about 100,000 years ago. Behavioral uh, in innovations, improvements, psychology, cognition, and so on. But of all of these things, I think we have many, you know, here's a trick question. Which is the organ in the body that's the most different between humans and chimpanzees? It's not the brain, it's your skin. Okay, so there's a lot of other differences I'm not talking about, but we're focusing on the brain here. So it turns out about 100,000 years ago, you start seeing inscriptions in Africa. And by 50,000 years ago, you start seeing cave paintings in different parts of the world. You start seeing complex tools like harpoons, start seeing shell beads about 100,000 years ago. Why would I make a shell bead unless I knew that you would appreciate my shell bead? I should have a theory of your mind, say, oh, so-and-so would love to see me in my shell beads, or I'd like to see that person with shell beads, and oh, then when somebody else comes along, you can say, oh, those are those people with shell beads, I know that they have shell beads. This is, you're talking about theory of mind. But the ultimate proof is burial. So about 95,000 years ago in what is now Israel and then in Africa, humans started burying their dead. Neanderthals did a few burials, but they were very primitive burials with nothing added. But in the human burials, you find a mother and a child buried together. You find a man buried with an antler of a deer. You find someone buried with some beads thrown in there. That means that those people are saying, that was a person like me. That, to me, that's the proof of theory of mind. That, that was a person like me. It's he or she has gone on somewhere else, I'm not sure where, maybe with my ancestors, but I need to say something, do something about it. So burials become really prominent. This is about 100,000 years ago. So I think, now I'm biased by my own theory, nobody has any other explanation. I think that's when this transition occurred. Anatomically, modern humans had many of these abilities and we jumped across this barrier and then we took over the planet. So let's go down this continuum, self-awareness, rudimentary theory of mind, full theory of mind, extended theory of mind. Turns out two-year-olds have self-awareness, you saw that spot test. Three to four-year-old humans have a rudimentary theory of mind. It takes about five years when a human really varies with individuals and societies, can really understand the mind of you. That's when the little kids start telling lies. In order to tell a lie, you have to understand the mind of the other person. Deceiving is, you know, as many animals will try to deceive you a little bit. To make a really good lie, you better know the mind of the other. Adult humans. Turns out in that intervening period, some children go through death anxiety, then soon they become invincible teenagers. Nothing can touch them, right? So I'm suggesting that 
you know, on ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny turned out to be not true in many cases. But here's a case where I think those are the Australopithecines, Homo erectus, anatomically modern humans, behaviorally modern humans, and that was the transition. Okay. So just to wrap up, uh, there's a lot more you can think of. Go out tomorrow and look for evidence of theory of mind. You'll find it everywhere. You can be a Hitler or a Mother Teresa with theory of mind. You can do anything, so many things with theory of mind. Think what would happen if you take it away. So I'm not going to talk about theory of mind. It's so obvious you'll see it everywhere and you don't see it in any other animal and what it can do for you, good and bad, by the way. But denial of reality has other consequences. Not only do we deny our mortality, we self-deceive ourselves, we become overconfident, we take risks. Humans are amazing at the risks that we'll take. No other animal will take the kind of risks that humans will take. We have what's called the optimism bias. I'll t t say a little bit more. There. We have afterlife myths. We have religiosity. We have theater. We have many ways of creating. We take drugs that modify our brains. We do things that deny reality because it makes us feel better. Because remember, this is in recent transition. It's not that we've all got this nice and clean and perfect. Everybody, among you, there are people who are anxious and fearful, all the way to people who are not afraid of anything. But most of you, except for the rare depressed people who sometimes commit suicide, uh, are not afraid of death. So while I was writing this, optimism bias comes out, and Tally Sherratt quoted me in Time magazine, Ajit Varke argues that the awareness of mortality on its own led to evolution to a dead end. The despair would have interfered with our daily function, bringing the activities needed for survival to a stop. The only conscious mental, way, conscious mental tr time travel, by the way, time travel is something we do with theory of mind. I can imagine myself in the future. I can imagine my grandfather. I can imagine my grandson if I ever have one. You know, I can imagine the future. Only way this could have happened is the evolution if it emerged together with the rational optimism. Because what is optimism? Optimism is denial of reality. What is extreme optimism? Extreme denial of reality. My grandfather was a friend of Gandhi, so I got to know a lot about Gandhi. What was Gandhi thinking? He's going to take on the British Empire with non-violence? What a ridiculous idea. What a hopelessly optimistic idea, right? But it pays off. He pays the ultimate price, but then you get Mandela and Martin Luther King. So we humans can take risks with optimism, and that may not pay off for us. It might pay off. But it turns out, actually, it pays off for individuals. Look at this little kitten here looking in the mirror, right? It turns out that if you model evolutionary modeling by James Fowler, shows that reacting in an overconfident manner can have fitness benefits as long as the contested resource is sufficiently large compared to the cost of competition. No Olympic athlete is going to win unless they say, I am the best, I am the best, I am the best. You have to psych yourself. The way you win is by being confident. But what is confidence? Denial of reality. What is extreme confidence? Extreme denial of reality. At some point it gets bad, right? You go too far with your confidence, right? But Turns out confidence pays off. So actually, once we got denial of reality, we got all these benefits of denial of reality. We can do this. Question? Yeah? So you mean to say that underconfidence is good? No, it's not good. Not good. Not at all good. You've got to be confident. But you just said that confidence means denial of reality. Yes, but that's good for us. <laughs> you have to think about that. <laughs> So that's the point. The denial of reality can be good for us. It got us through, the, not only got us through that, that peephole of evolution, but it got us to the point where we have this incredible ability to take on the planet, basically, right? That's the good news. Now, well, now you know, he asked a very important question. Why is denial of reality bad for us? We deny evolution. We deny climate change. We deny, some people in the United States think that putting fluoride in the water is a communist plot. <laughs> I mean, the, the number of conspiracy theories that humans come up with, perfectly intelligent people who have been to college and come up with these crazy ideas that they hang on to. How can that be? Because they can deny reality. Herbal cures, they work. doesn't matter what, whether you have proof or not. Vaccines, they don't work. You're having this problem in the U.S. also, I know, some strange ideas that, oh, vaccines cause autism, even though it's been completely disproven. Cold remedies, oh, if I squirt this particular thing in my nose before I get on the plane, I won't get a cold. And efficacy of prayer is an interesting question which is being researched. So here's an interesting thing. The bad news is, this is a doctor talking to the earth. You've got an advanced stage case of humans. 
The good news is they just about run their course and you should be on the mend soon. <laughs> so of all of these denials that we have, the most dangerous one is climate change. And Danny in 2007 was already writing about this, saying, look out, look out, trouble is coming, we are denying reality. And this is just one of the many graphs out there showing that the te temperature has been increasing and this is probably what's going to happen, actually right, the way things are going is going to happen like this. This is the best case scenario, even if we do everything right, we're still going to be in trouble. Here is a figure of the number of extreme weather events per decade. This is the last decade. <coughs> You don't have to be a scientist to understand what this means. And yet, in the United States, more than 50% of people deny climate change. I'm sure it's much less in India. But even though you agree on climate change, you know, when I left my hotel room today, I left one light on. I shouldn't have done that. For climate change, if I really was sincere, I should have turned that, the light off. I've done some things in my life, but I'm burning up carbon flying to, from, from U.S. to here, right? I'm not doing everything I can do. So in the face of reality, we can still, denial sounds like it's ignoring, it's actually maybe ignoring, you're sensing. So the Indian phrase comes in best here, chalta hai. <laughs> Somehow it'll work out. Now this is true of most things, maybe our health problems, maybe our economic problems, maybe it'll work out, we'll figure it out, but not climate change. You get only one chance. It's like getting on an airplane. So we have this problem, I have a good friend, Ramanathan is a very well-known climate scientist. He's always despairing. He says, people won't listen to us. And well, you know what they come to us and say, how sure are you? So, well, 70%. That typhoon, was that caused by climate change? Yeah, 50%. Oh, okay, come back to us when you have 100%, right? <laughs> you know what the problem is? Suppose I told you, I'm going to get on a plane tomorrow morning, right? Suppose somebody came to me and said, there's only 5% chance your plane is going to crash. Only 5%. 95% you'll be fine. I'm not getting on that plane. I want 99.9% .9 certainty. So the climate, we need 99.9% .9 certainty. So we need to stop talking, I'm trying to convince my climate friends to stop talking about global warming, climate change, it all sounds, it's global climate disruption, stupid, and you can't go back. Massive disruption, and you can't, can't say, oh, you know, we made a mistake, sorry, sorry, we should have paid attention, we're going to take care of things. No, it's too late. The weather's going to spin out of control, and there's, people are trying to fix it, and the fixes may be worse than the, than the thing. The Mark Twain said it best, I think. A man who carries a cat by a tail learns something and can learn no other way. <laughs> so we're carrying the climate by the tail right now. So I'm going to wrap up now and give you back the theory so you can think about it. Full theory of mind. I'm claiming that it will cause death, anxiety and failure to establish. Every once in a while an, an, an bird or an animal with self-awareness gets it, fails to establish. Denial of reality. If, you, if, if you're a animal and you go around denying reality, you'll be lunch for somebody else pretty soon, right? That's not good. It's not very stable. So denying reality by itself is not good. You can do it for a short period of time. Occasional animals will take risks, but nothing like humans. Risky behavior, failure to establish. Magic combination. One time. Few individuals get denial of reality and full theory of mind. Tolerance of death, anxiety, established combination. And then, of course, many other factors come into cement this uh, so, I'm not going to go through this list, but as a good scientist, I have to tell you that there are problems with the theory. None of them are killeth problems. None of them negate the theory. Um, and, uh, but I'll just mention two because these are the ones that come, come up most. The most common objection comes up, come on, what's the problem? I'm 25 years old. I've got so many years to live. I know the statistics. Why should I worry about my death? That's easy for you to say. You're a human that's passed through the, the evolutionary window. Imagine you're the first human whose wife just died in childbirth and your babies have died and your men, friend got eaten by a lion and you realize that's going to happen to me. It's a very different story. So you have to think back to that original time in evolution. Don't, don't, don't talk about modern humans. This is the commonest objection I get, by the way, from very sophisticated scientists. They say, no, 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 humans are rational. We can figure this out. But now we can figure it out. The other is there are no defined neural pathways to mediate the propulsion. This has to be in your brain, right, in the end. Turns out there are a few places, uh, the prefrontal, the amygdala is a structure deep in the brain that gives you the fear response. When you see a stick and you think it's a snake or you see a snake, you immediately react as the amygdala reacting. Turns out the amygdala is altered in humans in ways that we don't fully understand. The prefrontal cortex is the one that helps the amygdala to control stressful events. 
The anterior cingulate cortex responds to mistakes, staying on task, managing emotional reactions, and hippocampus for memory. So I'm predicting, and it turns out these are some of the regions where humans have differences. It's going to be a long time. As you know, the brain has more star, uh, neurons than the, I mean, neurons and their stars in the Milky Way. And if you take 1,000 connections per neuron, there are more connections in the brain than there are stars in the universe. It's going to take a long time for us to figure out the human brain, but we might figure out some of these things. So acknowledgments, I could spend all evening talking about acknowledgments. You can imagine something like this starts all the way from <clears throat> my family all the way to Danny Brower to everybody else, and all. there's no way I can go through it. So you, you can imagine the number of acknowledgments I'd have to give. But I do want to acknowledge Danny Brower. I recently went to Tucson to give the Danny Brower Memorial Lecture. I'd never met his widow before. I'd never seen her face, never seen a photograph of her. But over two years, I worked out a perfect agreement with her through email and phone. No other species can do that. That's theory of mind. So the challenge to you if you read the book, can you find any fatal flaw of the theory? This is what a scientist must do, right? So far I've not found one. I've not found that what Thomas Huxley called the ugly fact that destroys your theory. Now everything seems to fit. Everywhere I turn I see evidence of denial. Everywhere I turn I see theory of mind. This is the only, only species that has both is us. And our immediate ancestors probably didn't have it based on all the evidence, and it seems like only we have it. No other species has it. And of course, as a scientist, you must always say, can you think of a way to confirm the theory? Neural pathways may help. Uh, actually studying the ontogeny of death, death awareness in children might help. But most important, can you find a way to falsify the theory? That's what you're supposed to do. Unfortunately, most of the experiments you can think of would be the impossible to do, unethical to do. So we may never immediately find out, but uh, I'm hoping that in my lifetime we'll find out whether this theory is correct or not. So if you do uh, find, find, find something wrong with the theory or find a way to prove the theory or falsify or test the theory, let me know. Okay, so I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions.